we thought we'd offer today is our approach um, to information security within an enterprise architecture world. So, I am the enterprise architect for Plymouth University. I've been doing this role for about three years. Three years? Three years. Um, and when I was asked to do it, it was more a question of, it'll be fine, you know what you're doing, get on with it. Two weeks later, they told me, you're taking on security as well. Great. No nothing. Right? Absolutely nothing. But what I did understand was the architectural way of doing things. Well, our architectural way of doing things, boat building models and the like. Um, and what we thought was we'd share with you our development of how we're going to approach this security thing. Because Plymouth, to be perfectly frank, is in a pretty bad way. We have security, we have an architecture. It's not documented. We know it's out there somewhere. We know people are doing good things and the right things. But what it is for us is more a question of doing the right things in the right way and, and to move forward and take the organisation with us. So I don't know how many of you know about enterprise architecture. A lot of you probably won't care. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. Um, so this is us. So enterprise architecture has a perception within organisations um, at all levels um, in my discussions with other enterprise architects um, that we build ivory towers and we sit there quite happily and we say you will do this and you won't do that and we're blockers. We create complicated diagrams which mean nothing to anybody else but that's fine. Um, we use alienating jargon um, that perhaps service management colleagues, management, developers don't understand. And to a degree they're right. And we are in fact an obstacle to IT. But what enterprise architecture is, especially for us, is building a gap, uh, sorry, bridging a gap between what the business needs to do to function and thrive and what IT can deliver. So it's taking those goals and ambitions from the wider organisation here, from individual schools, faculties and departments, and putting it in terms of IT and how we can help drive the organisation forward. So in reality, there are no IT towers. We're workers. We, we get on, we do the day job. we normal working people. Yes, we do complicated diagrams that mean nothing to, to very few other people. However, it's about views on that information and providing views that people can understand. To be, to be honest, we're still developing that. Yes, we use jargon. We, we use, um, certainly here, we use a, a TOGAF framework for our, for our architecture um, and there is jargon built into that. We try not to use it when we're out and about, but sometimes you, you slip into bad old habits. And it's about bridging the gaps. So it, it's about doing the right things and doing them right for the organisation as a well. whole. So at Plymouth University, the important people are the students. Right? The rest of us are here to support the students. Um, and if they succeed, we succeed. Um, the, the whole organisation is geared towards that. So, aha, uh -huh. what do we use to do the enterprise architecture? We use tools, just like everyone else does. Um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. We talk to people, we spend a lot of time talking to people, or at least we do when they'll talk back. Um, we spend time doing research and reading, and we spend a lot of time modelling our environments within an architectural modeling tool. Um, we tend to love lists and spreadsheets and all that good stuff that contains a multitude of meaningless garbled information. Um, and we try to make sense of it. So hopefully what I'll show you in my little bit of this is the architecture um, leading up to, to where I hand over to Paul where he talks about security, which is what you're all here for today. So we develop models. I mentioned models earlier. So 
my background is not in IT, it's not in security. I, I'm actually a marine um, telecommunications engineer and marine navigation uh, specialist by <coughs> training. Um, I have been a sysadmin in, in the past and I'm bringing all that together. So I couldn't find an electronic chart to throw up, so I've, I've put up a map with layers, different elements building up a, a map. Um, this is true in enterprise architecture. We also look at layers. We look at the business layer where we look at people and roles and functions and processes and, and all that good stuff to, to understand how the business needs to operate. We layer that on top of an application and information layer where we know about what software is in use and how the data talks to each other and, um, and things like that. And supporting it all as a technology layer. Um, so you have a database, it sits on a server, we model it there. Um, so that tends to be the, the domain layers we work in. We also work in layers similar to the map on the left, where we have current, intermediate and future states of our architecture, whatever that is, whether it's um, um, a new data center coming online, whether it's um, information security, whatever it is, we would look at the base, intermediate and target architectures. I'm not entirely sure if this one will show very well. Probably not. Um, so when I was putting together these slides, I made the mistake of typing into Google models. And, and once I refined that search to omit um, things from Vogue and um, other more interesting magazines, um, I came up with a ship. And I thought, oh, OK, marine engineering, that's fine. We'll go with that. And, and that happens to be the enterprise, well, the model of the enterprise, enterprise architecture. Anyway. Um, so this is our baseline state. Back in the day, there was a sailing ship called the enterprise. Great. Um, things were simplistic. Okay? So the integrations with other things weren't quite as we would expect today. Communications between other systems, other ships were more manual. They'd run up a flag or, or wave their arms wildly to attract attention. Um, this, on this side, is a model of our baseline state of our development office. So, so where all the alumni functions happen. Um, they asked me to go in and do a little bit of road mapping for them. Um, it's fairly simple, so that's why I've shown it here. It's a small picture. Um, but it's a bit complicated. We have systems and requirements and goals and data flows. Not shown on there. It makes it horrible when I do. Um, but it's a very simplistic view. So that's our baseline state. What we have now, we need to understand it in order to meet their goal, their business objective at the very top. So we know where we start, we know where we finish. How do we get there? Through an intermediate state. Hey, look, it's the enterprise again. Slightly more modern. More communication channels. Okay, they're, they're using radio and radar and all sorts of wonderful things to get those airplanes off the deck. This is also more complicated. We've added more applications to, to make the system drive towards it. Um, the goals and the requirements stay the same. We've added a few ideas now to say this will help. And moving forward, the 2B, perhaps a more familiar picture of the enterprise, um, where everything talks together. We've introduced here because, believe it or not, we have very little understanding of our data. The use of an enterprise service bus to make the communications happen, to make their data and information flow more easily, still driving towards their goals. Um, so this is the layer thing, and it's something that we're applying now to information security. Other models we look at, roadmaps. I said we did this for our development office. There's a roadmap on the left that is actually this. Good old fashioned, well, you really can't read that one, um, data modeling. And one of Paul's diagrams um, are current antivirus infrastructure, which looks at servers and devices, processes, applications, and all that good stuff. And that is our baseline. So that's what we had six months ago. Yeah, good. So, that's pretty much it from me, apart to, to ask, so where's the security? We're back to those layers again. 
right? and in reality, what we need to achieve and what we are we are making a difference in is that security is everywhere. Right? We do it when we plan, we do it when we implement, and we do it post deployment. We ensure that it's there. And that's me. I'll, I'll hand you over to Paul. So, imagine our data center. It's not a data center, it's a series of boxes which are representing servers. They hold data, okay? Which way we Okay. So on that data, so on those servers, we've got plenty of databases and other sources of information. We've got data flowing between systems. We've got data going all over the place. At the minute, as Craig insinuated earlier on, a lot of this is undocumented, or it's still in people's heads. And I hate to say it, some people have left and taken knowledge with them. That happens in organizations. We weren't in a position to do a great deal about that. We are now starting to put processes in place so that when people do leave, there are proper transition processes moving forward. So we've got very little uh, documentation, which ultimately means that we have dark data. We know where some of our data is and we know what the purpose of some of that data is. There's an awful lot of data that we don't know what it is or where it does or what it is doing. It's the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, we're, we're slowly unpicking it, and as, as Craig sort of alluded to earlier on, with the data flow diagrams uh, using our enterprise tools, we're starting to look at database schemas and say, okay, what sort of information is being held in the system? Where is it going? Okay, why is it inconsistent to other things? So, to all intents and purposes, we have a, I'm going to call it a toxic environment. It's probably not the best term. Um, so, if you imagine web services at the university, we have, we have plenty of different instances. So we've got Joomla, uh, Apache, Tomcat, IIS. We've got many, many, many web servers doing, um, performing different functions. Some of them are really, really, really out of date. There's nobody's had so, so historically, the university within uh, information services have had uh, discrete teams. So there used to be a systems team that would create systems from scratch, look after them, catch them, maintain them, and then decommission them at the end of whenever they weren't needed. Um, but there is no real uh, life cycle management around these systems. It's always been down to individuals. and due to restructuring and various other bits and bobs, we seem to have lost the ability to maintain and look after our systems as it should be. So we have, I'm going to suggest, old versions of Apache. We've got new versions of Apache because new services are coming online, but people tend to forget the old stuff. Um, as, as John and uh, insinuated earlier on, it's a case of if it's not being, if it's not required, People tend to put it on the back burner and then you know, people forget about it. It's, it's not there. Oh, hang on a minute, somebody's still accessing it for this purpose. And we don't know about that until, heaven forbid, you know, a problem arises or somebody says that, you know, the, the link to this information, it's, it's all wrong, it's, it's old. Why have you still got this? Oh, we can do something about that. We have a few stakeholders within the organisation. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody knows certain bits of information. It's trying to pull all of those people together to get a consensus of, of information that is consistent and that we can do something with. And we have students and often they're unhappy because the level of service that they get is not what it should be. We are addressing that. It's not good, but we will make a difference. <coughs> and also, security isn't cheap. You can throw money at a problem if you've got the money to throw at a problem. The university in the past has kind of said, why aren't you doing this anyway? But there isn't a huge amount of money available. So we've, we've got a whole range of problems that we're trying to fix. So what we are trying to do through the enterprise architect practice is standardize. If we can standardize lots of different platforms, we have a known set of problems. We're not looking at 
okay, this one does is associated with this database or this web technology. So if we were able to say, okay, we'll start consolidating all of our web services down into specific pools, have a farm of servers that will be of a known build, a consistent known server baseline build, it will make things easier. We will be in a position where we will be better from a security point of view because we will be we won't be as reactive after a time when we know there's a problem. We can keep on top of things straight away. It will cost us less money. And unfortunately my slides don't like a Mac. Um, but students will be happy because we'll be delivering them the business benefit that they need to get on and do their studying. There won't be any uh, well, our, you know, service over here has had to go down because, yeah, um, we need to do some server patching that we haven't done for three or four months. So, cyber security. This is, so, to take things back to basics, because that's what we've had to do because we're in a, in a toxic environment, we're assuming that we don't know what we've got. So let's go back to basics. Basics. 10 steps to cybersecurity. It's a really good benchmark from where to get to. So what we've done is we've modeled um, the 10 steps. This is looking specifically at secure configuration. And we've identified a number of risks of not doing things, a number of requirements that we need to have to address those risks, and a number of capabilities. Now we have some of those capabilities in many different shapes and forms not all of them as mature as the others. So we have a, a client baseline build. We have images that we deploy to our student and staff fleets. We have a server build. Mm, not quite as good because it's not often as maintained. Um, I'm going to suggest that our server build is probably years old. When a new server is spun up, it is a case of you then have to sit and wait patch up to date. During that time, it's, it, yeah. it shouldn't be. We should be in a better position knowing that our servers are fully resilient before we start doing things with them. Um, Desired configuration manager. So we have a concept now um, whereby we have a, a cloud-based service that can deploy configurations to known server builds. We're in a better position than we used to be. Things are moving in the right direction. So one of the other things that we, we are looking to do is to become properly PCI DSS compliant. PCI DSS is a wonderful set of requirements um, looking at financial data and the security of the transmission of this data. So that's the, the blue strip all on the top and down the side. It's over, if we were to combine these two sets, these two frameworks of security together, it gives us a really good starting point. The only problem being is there's an awful lot of work to do there. It's work that we need to do, it's not something we're going to shy away from, but it's just going to take a bit of time to get there. There are areas of overlap. Sorry. Um, we are in a position where we're consolidating down, making sure that we're, we're, we're not going to be duplicating effort because this is not something that we can pick up and, and run with within a year. It's something that we will be doing over time. But we're making sure that we deliver as much value as quickly as possible in an appropriate manner to the organisation. So, the university has been through the process of um, implementing a new network within the last six months. Um, one of the problems that we have is that we've got a number of halls of residence around the city centre. And the idea is that students that live in a halls of residence during their time at the university or during a, an actual year, they receive the same level of service that an internet service provider would provide if you were living in a private accommodation in a privately rented house. So, you know, same state standards as Virgin, BT, anyone else that you want to use, we need to provide that level of service. We're not going to constrain what you can do to a point. Um, 
we've not been in that position to be able to deliver that service properly before now. So this is the model as it was um, before the project started delivering. <coughs> we've got, um, so the university network, we've got wire connections, wireless connections, we've got our edge room service, um, we've got a firewall there that is old, um, and access to the internet. The problem being, is that in the halls of residence, people have a wired connection and wireless connectivity. The wireless connectivity works, it isn't, it isn't pervasive. You can't just walk from one building to another and keep your connection or transfer over to another access point, keeping that seamless process. That's where we need to be. And from a wired network point of view, um, we, so if your device supported WPA2 Enterprise, you'd be fine. If it didn't, you likely would have to go to the uh, service management team and say, okay, I want to plug my Xbox into my wired socket. Um, I've got a new game, but it needs all these ports opening up. And the network team would just sit there and go, oh, well, okay, let's, let's poke a hole in the firewall for this, 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 this. Um, and it would be done across the whole network. It, it's it was a, a practice that we'd built up over time and it hadn't really worked. So all in all, we weren't delivering a great service to our end users. So, sorry, that's highlighting the problems that we had. Um, so up until recently, this is how things look from an architectural point of view. So we've changed some things. We've got um, wired and wireless networks. We've changed the way that the network works. Um, we ha now have better, more secure firewalls, Great. Um, but we still have problems. So if your wired device doesn't support um, a particular connection type, you won't get access. So we still have gaps, but at least we know those gaps now and we can start addressing them because we've got a technology that will look after the rest of it. We've got wireless networking that now covers the whole of the campus. So those problems have gone away. Now let's focus on what we need to do. So what do we do? We create a, a, a discrete package of work to be able to deliver the functionality that we need. We've now got, it's coming soon, we've got a self-service portal where students can say, I've got my internet connected fridge. I need to plug it onto the network in my room so I can come home and make sure my milk's nice and cold. Whatever it is, I don't mind, as long as we're delivering what the students need in a secure environment. So, we've got um, people taking responsibility, there's first and second hand support. If anything were to go wrong, that's fine. Um, what do we get rid of? We, oh, you can't do that. We have that capability, it's all there. Can give you a hand, Mike? In all intents and purposes, we have a better understanding of where we are and how we can deliver a better service going forward. We, we, we've got to that target architecture, which now becomes our baseline for future reference. Okay, so enterprise architecture modeling is really good. This is a diagram that's showing some servers um, that have, they are Windows Server 2008 or two variants that support three, uh, internet, uh, three communication protocols, TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. .1 so TLS 1.2 is where we want to be, and all of our servers now are capable of that. They weren't a little while ago because uh, Windows Server 2003 didn't have that capability, so we had to change that. We're getting rid of Windows Server 2003, it's really old. Um, but if we are in a position where we, we find out or we're told that there's a vulnerability in TLS 1.0 or something similar, we now have the capability, without going to four or five different systems, to say, okay, what's affected? Okay, um, Apache um, is run on, you know, runs using these protocols, oh, where, where are our problems? Previously, we'd have to go to a number of different teams 
and we'd spend a few days looking at where are our problems. We now have the ability to actually go to Corso and say, right, we've got a problem with TLS 1.0. Search for it. Here are the list of systems that are using that at this point in time. So to set that one step further, um, if we are in a position where we then want to drill down further, so we know that we've got a problem, hang on a minute, um, so TLS 1.0 is having a problem. It's also used um, in its default configuration on Windows Server 2012. Okay, we can do something about that. What business services or what applications are affected? You then get the ability to drill down to say, actually, oh look, there's, there's lots of student services um, that are going to be affected if we have to take down the service. Well, it's a student service. We've got to make sure that this is resilient. We've got to make sure it's, it's secured. We have no reason not to do that. It gives us the ability to pinpoint these systems and address them in an appropriate manner. Because when we're developing systems, as John was insinuating later on, you don't have one of them. You have multiple of them, so that you can take one down, bring it up to a known standard, transfer over to another server, and take this mm -hmm. one down and patch it. So you have known builds, consistent configuration across the environment. It was a whistle stop tour, I apologise. But if anybody's got any questions, happy to take.